Hey, what's up out there? It's Dave Duford from Final Expense Agent Mentor at feagentmentor.com where I help agents like you succeed in selling life insurance and insurance in general. And in today's video, I am specifically delving into one of my favorite topics as it relates to the insurance sales presentation. So specifically, what we're going to be talking about is the second step of the four-part sales training uh, presentation training that I give uh, to teach insurance agents how to effectively uh, sell insurance. So this particular subject, this particular topic is entitled how to effectively pre-qualify and fact find your insurance prospects. So uh, this is my favorite, like I said, section because I think uh, when it comes to sales, the magic of getting results of, of, of figuring out if the person you're across the table from actually uh, is somebody that is qualified, that, that, that is somebody who will buy from you, is determined in the section. Uh, incidentally, it is most commonly the section or the aspect of the sales process that is forgotten uh, or minimized or downplayed. And I think it's a real shame because there's a lot of insurance salespeople that waste an unduly amount of time sitting down with prospects trying to pitch them on their particular product when it's all just done in vain. And the outcome to the salesperson is that they become more frustrated, uh, they don't sell as much, they spend, or I should say, waste more time with unqualified people, and many of them leave this business because they're frustrated by Nobody's buying, nobody's interested, blah, blah, blah. Whereas if you employ an effective sales training method to effectively pre-qualify and effectively fact find, what you'll figure out very early on in the sales process is whether or not your prospect actually is a qualified buyer. And so this is why we do it. You see, folks, our job as salespeople is to make sure, our first of all, our time is effectively spent with the best odds buyers out there. Now, I say best odds because sometimes even if you use effective pre-qualification tactics, if you follow my, my selling strategy to a T, you won't always convert everybody who is a high odds prospect. However, that's why the, the reality is no system is perfect. And that's why we want to effectively design a, a process so that we weed out the low uh, great opportunities and really spend an inordinate amount of our time in front of who we've determined to be effective and, and highly uh, likely to be buyers. So uh, pre-qualifying is really what allows us to determine if these people are actually buyers or not. Now what's cool is you may be thinking, well, aren't we selling these people? Aren't we persuading these people to buy? Well, the answer in, in most cases is no. In fact, I believe what's, what's amazing about the pre-qualification section is that there really is very little selling at all. And believe it or not, um, you're not actively trying to convince them of anything. Um, what this section's purpose is to do is to really get into the mind of your prospect to figure out if what makes them tick, what motivated them, motivate them to take action, to request information, and to figure out really and to help them and incidentally by asking these questions to figure out if, if this is really something they're serious about, whatever it is that you're selling, and to determine the level of urgency, need, desire, as well as things like uh, health qualification, budget, bank account, whatever the variables are you need to have ahead of time uh, determined. So uh, again, why do we do this now instead of later? Because if you wait to ask these questions later, uh, you may not make that pivotal connection emotionally, in many cases, that's necessary to push a deal beyond, oh, I'll need to think about it, to yeah, this is something I definitely need to do. Because a lot of our prospects hinge upon the fence where they could go either way. And a good, effective routine of asking uh, very good questions will open up those opportunities to you more often than if you don't. So really what pre-qualification uh, in selling comes down to is, is determining what the major objections are to you, your client buying. Now, each of us has some similar objections that we experience, and uh, some of us have product-specific objections. Um, when I design my final expense presentation, and knowing what I know about pre-qualifying, 
my job was to say, okay, what are the most common reasons somebody doesn't buy? And to determine base and determine what they don't the reason they don't buy, and then design my line of questioning and pre-qualification stage based around those objections. Why? Because I want to take care of these objections or these potential objections well ahead of time and not 20, 30, 40 minutes down the line after I get done presenting, showing what I do, offering a deal, and then start to rebuttal all of these things that I could have handled ahead of time. Uh, I, again, I'm a stickler about my time. I want to make sure it's spent um, on a good measure, on a good note, and to make sure that the people I'm talking to um, are my kind of people. So what in final expense, we'll just go ahead and go with this. If, if we're designing a pre-qualification scheme or, or a series of questions, you need to know what objections are most common for your product. And usually there's three to five objections, okay? And I'll include in here conditions to buy to, and you'll see what that means in a minute. But let's take final expense, for example. So reasons why somebody doesn't buy. Uh, no need, no desire, doesn't health qualify. Um, no bank account, and that's a condition to doing business, or won't let you draft. That might be a condition. It might just be an objection that you can overcome. And then no budget, no money. Okay. So again, instead of figuring this out later, I figured, well, how can I answer these questions now to figure out ahead of time if, uh, if these people meet my criteria? So let's look at each of these. And what I want you to think as I'm asking this, whether you're with final expense and you sell final expense, this is great. It'll be very applicable. But if you sell Medicare supplements, if you sell mortgage protection, if you sell any kind of insurance product, these principles, these fundamentals will apply. And so as I'm answering why or how I address these, need, these five uh, potential objections, I want you to be thinking about the product you sell uh, and think about the objections you've heard in your short experience doing this. Or if you're brand new, talk to your mentor, talk to your person that's most experienced with the kind of product that you sell and learn from them to say, hey, what kind of objections do you most commonly hear? You know, maybe top three to five. And then, and then get a little more information and then develop some questions that will overcome this uh, or disqualify them. So uh, let's start with need. So one of the best questions that I ask when I pre-qualify my final expense clients is that I ask um, right up front to get this particular section started as I ask, and I think every single person who does any kind of lead generation, whether it's final expense or otherwise, needs to do or ask this type of question. What were your thoughts and concerns when you mailed back this card, if, if we're doing direct mail leads? If it's Facebook leads, telemarketed leads, seminar leads, it doesn't matter. Rephrase it, because the most important aspect of this is, why did you do what you did? That is the essence of what you're trying to capture. You see, I think it's really important from the get-go to understand why people took action. One thing that you'll realize uh, in life, uh, especially if um, you deal with non-salespeople, uh, most people go through life not taking action. They sit on their laurels, they watch as time goes by, they wish they could be successful, they wish they could go out there and, 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 and see the kind of results that some people do in life, the top 20%, the top 10 or 5%, and they want that. But they never take the first step. They never take the first course. They never take the first step to try to get some help. Maybe they've got a brother who's successful or an uncle. They never ask. They never take action. And so when somebody, and that's applicable to everything in life, when somebody takes action to take a risk, to figure out, to send this card back, to answer a telemarketing call, knowing that they probably hate salespeople or that they're going to get a salesperson the call or they're going to get some kind of potential risk that they're going to face. The fact that they do it anyway is an, an interesting question as to why I'm asking. And what I'm, and the reason I'm, I'm stating this is because knowing all this, the fact that they send this in, knowing that something's going to happen, means there's probably some really good reason uh, why they did what they did as it relates to the product that we're selling. So when I ask somebody, what were your thoughts and concerns when you mailed back this card? And they say something like, look, I'm not getting any older. My brother died. They didn't have money to bury him, and I'm not doing that to my kids. Bingo. I have got need, and I've got desire coupled into that question. So that's the first aspect of selling, I think. You need to know, whoops, we do this live here Monday through Friday, ladies and gentlemen, and sometimes I forget to turn my phone off. So let me turn this off here, and then I'll continue. 
All right. So what's cool about this question is that um, what ends up happening is that you actually get um, the need and want aspect out of the way right up front. Um, again, we need to know what these people think and what's motivating them to take this action. I, I did a, in my inner circle group, I have a membership program for final expense agents that want ongoing coaching, uh, specific training to them, access to my training materials. It's a month to month membership deal. You can contact me if you're interested. I'll tell you more about it. But in my last session on Friday, I had reviewed an agents of mine. Uh, his, he's a brand new agent. And we, we looked at his sales presentation. And um, he did not ask that question, what were your thoughts and concerns when he sent back the card? And what you'd notice as you listen through the presentation, the whole thing kind of meandered back and forth. And, 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 and he went to pitching the product. He went to talking about burial. Well, he didn't even know if she was interested in getting burial coverage. He didn't even know if she had a budget. Um, and he was kind of all over the board. Granted, he was new. It's not a personal uh, criticism. As much as it's an example, it's demonstrable of what happens if you don't start off on the right foot. So long story short, always ask, why did you do what you did in so many terms? Why am I here? What were your thoughts and concerns when you sent back this card? And then from there, just sit back and listen. So there's a couple other aspects to this. Um, I, I like asking, um, you know, uh, if you if, if they've got, what are you doing right now for your existing life insurance? Uh, I ask this question because I want to know if they're a buyer. I also want to know who the incumbent policy is to see if there's an opportunity to improve upon what they have. Again, I want to know that now. I might get through an entire sales presentation and be ginned up on how great my plan is and how competitive it is, and that just may say, I need to think about it. And they may say, yeah, I've already got coverage. Oh, man, all that time spent, I could have just asked the question, and 99% of the time you're going to get all the information you need off of it anyway. And plus, it segues into doing a review, meaning if you, get the, if you get the information, say, hey, one thing I do as a courtesy to my clients is I review their existing coverage. Probably haven't had your agent over here in years to look at it. We want to make sure you've got the right kind of plan before I make any suggestions. Do you mind grabbing that for me? Uh, a lot of the time, you'll get it, and then you can show them what they have and, and then demonstrate your authority. It's all good. And you can do that with any insurance product. Anybody that you deal with that may have something that you already sell, do a policy review. And by asking that question, it gets you to that point. And again, that helps you sell when it comes to selling because you've got stuff in fine print. If what they have has some inferiority to it, you can demonstrate why that's the case. So um, I like asking them, um, when it comes to final expense, do you want to be buried or cremated? Uh, this gives me an idea of how much coverage you're looking for. Uh, one, and then I'll add on to this, um, I'll, I'll ask them, what, kind of, what do you want your policy to do for you? And so when I ask that question, it just, it's an open-ended question, and we're going to describe the different kind of questions in a minute. But that allows them to go into detail about, okay, yeah, I want this policy to leave a legacy to the, my, my kids, the people I love. And again, going back to what we just talked about with my agent, if he had asked that question, he would have known right away what's motivating this woman. She had already set aside cash for burial or cremation maybe. She was the least bit motivated there. She wanted to leave money to her kids as a legacy. So he could have built, if he had known that, could have built his presentation on how we leave legacies through life insurance and how it's a benefit to you versus not doing it. See what I'm saying here? So as we ask these questions, we really get to see what these motivations are of our clients. And then we hone in on them when it comes to presentation time and then really make a custom tailored presentation designed to get them the results that they're looking for. So after we do that, um, other questions I'll ask, uh, like let's look at some other plan types. So let's say we're selling Medicare supplements. A good question to ask is, what do you like best about your Medicare supplement or Medicare Advantage, whatever you're selling? And, and, and what you'll get there are the things that make them happiest. Uh, and it's especially useful if you're selling Medicare supplements because Medicare supplements are standardized. Again, knowing this as a Medicare supplement agent, um, it means all your plans are the same. The only difference is price when it comes to supplements, okay? Not in Advantage plans. And so the things that they say they like about their plan, well, now you can have the hot button issues that they're most concerned about, and you can address those when it comes to presenting. Same thing by asking the, the, the inverse, which is, what do you like least about your plan? Oh, I hate the price increases. I love the plan. They've done well by me. I hate the price increases. So you can ask questions like that. Um, 
And again, what this all is beginning to do is develop the picture and, and take away the layers of things that um, you know are more substance or surface oriented and getting to the emotional hot buttons that lie beneath the surface that really motivates somebody to make a decision to buy or change something up. So um, uh, let's keep going here. Um, oh, other kinds of questions here. So I like to ask, uh, depending on the product I'm selling, I like to what's called sell the premium. So when we sell the premium, essentially what that means is that I am uh, qualifying on budget. I like to know well in advance before I even talk about the kind of product that I offer, uh, if I can get them something at a certain budget level. And uh, what that affords me, no pun intended, is the knowledge that I have at least some level of financial commitment because that's always a big deal for a lot of people is, geez, this sounds good, but how much does it cost? And I'd like to take care of that well in advance so that, again, I get them sold on something. I get them closed on something. They can't object to the budget when they say they can afford 60 to $80 a month or whatever it is. Um, if I can't do a budget close, I'll do what's more of what's called a trial close. So a trial close is where it's an if-then conditional statement that gets them conceptually closed on the product. So let's go back to Medicare supplements. If I say something like, if I can get you, if I could show you a way to get a Medicare supplement plan that does exactly what you like with your current plan, it, it pays claims on time, there's no networks, but it also saves you hundreds of dollars a month, would, you do, would this be something you'd be interested in? And so what would happen is if they say yes, that doesn't mean they're going to buy necessarily, but it's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good uh, indicator that they will if you can meet the conditions. Because some people, if they do say no to that, well, they're stuck on something. Maybe they just have a, and it's good, maybe they have a loyalty uh, to the existing company that is a bit irrational. Uh, maybe they just don't believe in switching. Maybe they're just confused and scared and don't know yet, and we'll kind of sell them on why that's no big deal when we show them the standardization process uh, of, of Medicare supplements. But um, certainly, at least it gives us an idea of where their hinge point is, even if they say no, and how to address that now versus waiting down the line in the actual close. Uh, but it gets, their, it gets them conceptually closed. It gets your prospects conceptually closed, and it allows you to know you can proceed to present and sell it a little bit as long as they're um, uh, uh, committed to the requirements. So other things you'll do in the pre-qualification section include um, asking about health. That's kind of a given. You want to know um, if somebody is qualified uh, for whatever product you're selling. If you sell multiple products, you want to know that in advance, uh, especially if you sell something like final expense or you lead with Medicare but cross-sell final expense or indemnity plans. You might want to sell a Medicare supplement as your lead or a Medicare Advantage, but maybe they can't qualify because of health reasons. Let's say if they have a Medicare supplement, but you find out through some of the fact finding that you did that they've got perhaps an opportunity to sell them final expense. And so um, you want to know this stuff well in advance so you don't have to worry about this later down the line. Uh, and, and again, save an opportunity to make a sale, whereas maybe you couldn't if you didn't ask these questions ahead of time. Uh, speaking of which, if you sell, if you're more of a generic agent, uh, you want to ask about different products in, in different ways. You want to ask them, well, so one, let, let me ask you one question, Mrs. Prospect. Um, what are you doing right now for your life insurance? A lot of people uh, have concerns about that. And then you just simply record this information down. Or maybe while you're asking about health questions, you know, you mentioned about cancer. And I've never had cancer. Have your family had cancer? Oh, yeah, all my family members had cancer. How was it? Oh, it was horrible. It cost a lot of money. It was a travesty. But maybe there's a concern where you can come at the end and upsell to a cancer plan because they've got an emotional experience dealing with a loved one with cancer. So um, anyways, uh, I don't know if you can hear my girl screaming in the background, but uh, welcome to a house of four kids. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk about kind of as we wrap this up, uh, the kind of questions you want to ask, because this is the real important thing. So you just can't ask any kind of question. You've got to ask um, a series of different questions where most of your questioning is going to be open-ended questions. So for those of you uh, who don't know what open-ended questioning is, it's basically when I ask a question where there has to be a level of detail uh, to reply to it, and it is a non-binary 
<laughs> question. Uh, so meaning it's not a yes, no question. Like, uh, what color is the sun? Uh, well, that's kind of open-ended. Uh, is the sun up? Yes or no? That's a binary yes, no question. We don't want to ask that. What we want to ask is, what do you think about your existing life insurance coverage? What were your thoughts, concerns when you sent back the card? And those questions, what they allow for is a detailed, open-ended explanation as to what the client thinks. It's not that you don't want to ask yes, no questions. It's uh, you want to ask questions in which um, lead initially to a conversation, okay? And then you'll want to use yes, no questions to clarify points of confusion. So when you say, when somebody says, yeah, I love my plan, my Medicare supplement plan, but I hate the price increases. I'm so sick and tired of the price increases. And, and so you say, well, okay, so let me ex- make sure I understand, Mr. Jones, what you're saying is, is that you love what you have, you like it a lot, but these price increases are killing you, right? Yeah. So that's a yes, no question that reinforces and clarifies for you what it is that their concerns are. And in their mind, it makes sure that we peg them in a pos- position, well, not necessarily pe- we, us pegging them, but allowing them to make sure that what their statement is, is exactly what they think. And it gives them the opportunity to say, well, no, because X, Y, Z to help clarify. Um, I also like to add uh, probing questions. So um, you want to do probing questions to follow up with some of these open-ended questions. When somebody says, what were your thoughts, concern when you send back this card? You know, I'm not getting any older uh, or I'm not getting any younger. And, uh, you know, uh, I just watched my mother die. And uh, yeah, I need this insurance. Okay, so when you say you watched your mother day, how do you mean? What exactly do you mean by that? So it's an open-ended question, but you're probing that particular question because some people just aren't necessarily in, ingrained in going full emotional on you, you know, okay? They, they don't want to uh, uh, spill their guts. Some people are reserved. I'm like that. I may not go full, uh, full course on my emotional state to a stranger. So sometimes you got to cajole it out. You got to probe it out and you can with good questions. So questions like, how do you mean when you say this, how do you mean? And then sit back, shut up. I'll mention that and I'll add into this, into this selling process, especially with pre-qualifying. You want to make sure that you shut up when you ask questions. Um, A lot of the times um, I learned this tactic from uh, Tim Wenders. I think he was a sells 400,000 a year in final expense in 2009 and 2010, uh, one thing I picked up from him is that uh, he does not, when somebody asks a question or answers a question, he takes two or three seconds to just nod his head and say, mm-hmm, and just wait. He's patient, and it's a little bit, sounds a little awkward, but what happens is, is, is if you're quiet and you're making eye t- contact and you're, you're at, you basically, when you nod your head, mm-hmm, and you look interested, you're asking for them to provide more information. So what you'll find out is a lot of the times, if you're just not waiting for the moment to jump in and talk and blah, 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 they'll give you even more information, okay? They'll just let it keep coming. So take time before you jump back in. It may seem awkward at first. You know, you think you got to jump right in when there's a breath. Let them take a breath and you'll find they'll keep going because they'll just feel like they have to in order to um, continue. And again, what happens is it gets you a layer a lower, a layer deeper, and to understanding what the client is saying and what matters to them. Um, so this is pre-qualification in a nutshell. Let me co- go ahead and summarize for you what you've learned today and uh, what you can do to take action. So again, pre-qualifying is all about asking solid, open-ended questions to, ar- to arrive at, uh, uh, for us as agents, to arrive at a determination as to what our client is motivated by why they did what they did, what they currently have, why they think the way they do, and then to go deeper and clarify why that's important to them. And the whole goal of pre-qualification, besides just asking questions, is to overcome objections before they occur. Uh, If you're coming in late to this, best thing you can do, uh, whatever you're selling in the insurance business, think of the top three to five objections that you experience, and then learn how to address those in a question format, open-ended, question format right in the beginning of the sales call after you build a little rapport and introduce yourself. You'll find that you'll overcome a lot of these objections a lot faster. And if not, you'll be able to end sales calls quicker so that you don't have to spend an inordinate amount of time with a non-qualified buyer. 
Um, also, you want to ask questions about, um, uh, and for most people, a question, open-ended questions about need, desire, that fuels urgency. Of course, we want to ask health questions. Uh, you'll, you know your, health, your products are what best, so you got to know what your health questions are and create a list of questions you must ask. Always ask for prescriptions too. Uh, that's important as well and to physically see them. Uh, make sure you, if, it, if it's applicable to you, uh, get a commitment on budget uh, in this section too. It may seem hard to ask for the money now without really telling them what you're there for. But um, at this point, you'll, they'll tell you kind of what they want, what they're looking for. And then if you can get them to commit to a budget, um, you know, at least you know that they're not flim flamming you and they're just uh, tire kickers. Because uh, they'll say they're tire kickers. Oh, maybe I can afford it. You know, you'll, you'll, if you ask, you'll eventually get a buyer who's been really enthused by all these lines of questioning. They'll say, yeah, I can do that. That sounds really good. And they're really well qualified. And that's what's beautiful about this. That's the beauty of this is that the pre-qualification section, once you get to the end of it, and before you start explaining really in detail what you do, think about the kind of person you have in front of you at this point. If they've answered everything to the positive, you've got a client that has demonstrated uh, emotionally, their need for the product as well as the desire for it. They've also been able to be health qualified, so you know what product you're looking at, you know which ones to stay away from, um, and you know that they've got a level of commitment uh, based on the financials if you're in fact trying to sell them something that's going to take their money, whereas maybe with Medicare you're giving them money. Uh, but they're conceptually sold at least, and they're at least sold on the budget at a minimum. Think about the person you're with at this point. This is a pretty good prospect, right? I mean, this is somebody that is going to be very receptive. They're very open-minded to what you're selling. They've given you a lot of good information. You know what makes them tick. And now when you transition to this sales presentation where you demonstrate what your product does and why it's better, now you can hand-select the words that they use to describe their emotion, their desire, their wants, their needs. And you can insert that into the presentation through the process of educating them, uh, sharing stories from people like them to bolster and reinforce the points. Your presentation is going to be absolutely powerful than just going in there and doing a canned job presentation, which just sucks and a lot of people just resent anyway. The last thing I'll leave you with, guys, another nice thing about pre-qualifying when you do it this way, and again, this is all within the first 10 to 15 minutes of the sales presentation. When you pre-qualify like this right up front and they don't meet uh, one of your criteria to buy, um, again, for final expense, it's need, want, bank, health, and budget. If they don't meet one of those, the, pro the presentation's over. I don't have to spend another 20, 30, 40 minutes trying to beg them to buy because, look, if they don't have a need for this, and I've already kind of started some basic questions and they're just not receptive, they're closing me down, look, I'm done, I'm gone. I have not wasted my time with a prospect who just doesn't need it. Or perhaps somebody who just is broke, they can't afford 15, 20 bucks a month. Or maybe they just... They're so loyal to their insurance company that even if I demonstrate to them that what's out there is exactly the same, uh, and even if I could show them the case and save the money on top of that, that it's exactly the same with a better price, that they still won't budge. Well, my findings, and if I were to pitch them anyway, I'm just wasting a lot of time waiting for the, the cat to bark, basically. It's never going to happen. And so I just pack up and go and find a real prospect. And that's, the, that's what's great about this. It, it retains the dignity of you, the, the sales professional. Uh, you're not begging for deals anymore when you do it this way. Um, you're spending your time not with people who are going to disrespect your time and not tell you the truth and not be forthcoming. You're going to spend time with real, live, quality prospects. You're going to be happier because of it. Uh, you're going to take more control of the sales process. Uh, whether they buy or not. And uh, I believe this is huge in that it reduces the frustration factor that every final expense or life insurance or Medicare agent ever experiences. And uh, when you do that, it's a good feeling. Um, you know that you've done everything possible short of you know being a jerk and pressuring them or anything like that, which I wouldn't recommend anyway, uh, to sell them a policy uh, or to qualify them. Because why would somebody who doesn't meet qualification buy, right? I mean, if they love what you have but don't have money, then what are you doing there? You know, there's no point in doing it. So that's pre-qualification. I do hope that you enjoyed this particular sales training call. Um, this, again, is something I think is worth spending a lot of time getting good at and getting better at. 
And it uh, looks like I got some questions here. So I'm going to spend the next uh, couple of minutes here uh, doing Q&A with the guys in the chat. Hey, Michael, good morning. Wow, LOL. Hey, how you doing? Um, don't know what you're LOLing about. Hopefully everything's okay. Screaming kids in the background probably, right? Okay. Uh, Michael asks, DM leads, why did you send this in? What about TM leads? Okay, cool. Um, same phraseology. So what Michael's asking is, let's say I'm buying telemarketed leads and I'm showing up, up at the sales presentation. I sit down normally with the direct mail piece. I would say, what were your thoughts, concerns when you sent back this card? Um, same thing. What were your thoughts, concerns when you uh, replied or talk to us over the phone? Why did you, what were your thoughts, concerns when you agreed to let me come over or something, or when you agreed to get this information? Again, that's, that's actually the, the late, less important part. The more important part is, the, is why. What were your thoughts and concerns? And then figure out some language to better clarify that because we're trying to get thoughts, logic, and concerns, emotion with this uh, initial question. Um, okay, Vin uh, asks, um, from your experience, is it easier to sell final expense to men or women, single or married? What is the minimum income to actually qualify for the commitment? Who stays on the book longer? Okay, hey, Ben, thanks for your question. Good question, by the way. So I'll kind of break this down to some extent. So um, I don't know, man. Um, I, you know, we human beings have a tendency to remember uh, extraordinary circumstances. I, I have sold, well, let me see. I, I sold one man, like 12,000 in premium of final expense at 85, you know, so men then were really like my favorite clients ever, but I've also done the same with, with a woman. Um, I think, I think, let me put it this way. They're all, some are going to buy and some aren't. Uh, what percentage buys more than the other? I really don't know. Um, but I don't think that you should actually take action to segment your list to target one over the other. Um, I've, I've no, known of agents that prefer to work with women or widows, and it, a lot of it does make perfect sense, right? I mean, if you're a widow, you've seen your loved one die. You've seen your spouse die. You know, you've buried your husband. That sucks. Okay, so uh, yeah, you're going to be a little bit more inclined to listen, especially if there was no money to do it, and you had to beg, borrow, and steal uh, to get the funds. So um, yeah, so that's kind of, to me, I, I, I mean, I I think on the whole that women are probably better buyers of it and probably keep it better, just kind of like on an instinct level. But I wouldn't change any of my, my demographics uh, just because men will buy too. Also, you've asked single and married. That's a good question too. I think that in final expense, um, probably, that's a good question. I think, I don't know. It's, just, it's almost the same answer, Vin. I mean, uh, you're going to drop mail and some are going to be married, some are going to be single, and you're not going to not target them and not try to sell them. Uh, uh, it's a little more complex, not much so with a married couple, because first you got to make sure both are there. You don't want to do one-leggers, right? Where you just pitch the woman or the male and the spouse isn't there and they come home and blow it for you. You got to make sure they're both there. So there's a little more coordination effect. And you got to be sure when you're selling a husband and wife to include both of them. Just, just don't go to the man and start talking to him and disrespect the woman. You know, a lot of the times the women's the one who's like, you were going to get this, whether you like it or not, Mr. Man. And they'll go kicking and screaming, but still do it. Uh, so uh, I, you always want to make sure you get both involved. Ask them, how do you think about this? What do you think, Mrs. Jones? Get them involved. Get them talking. Because sometimes one will be for it and the other won't be. And that's usually a sign you didn't do a good job of, of getting them both involved. And, and the one that won't be says, yeah, let's think about this. And, or the spouse will look at the other. The, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. You got that look, you know, like, you know, and, and everything. They'll know exactly what they're thinking and say, well, okay, well, this is good, Dave. Let us think about it. And, uh, but you've done something to offend her or him or not include them. So it's really important. Um, we're at, we're, but the upside is you get two sales out of it a lot of the times. Um, I think it tends to stick a little better because there's an impetus on both to follow through. Uh, whereas single people, you know, easier to get immediate appointments for. But the other thing is they're single. You'll get one sale. Less disposable income too. Okay, uh, what is the minimum income to actually qualify for commitment? I mean, that just depends on age. I mean, I'll take a $10, $15 policy all day long. I don't care. 
you know, I, I sell the premium, which means I start at, if I can qualify for a program today, can you afford somewhere between 80 and hundred dollars a month? If they say no, blah, 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 50 to 70, 25 to 35, no, well, can you do 10 to 15? Yeah, I'll sell it to them. I mean, money's money. Uh, it pays my gas bill, right? I'm not going to leave that on the table. Now, you will have agents who will say, well, the policies under 30 bucks a month are, are very inconsistent or impersistent, if that's a word, uh, meaning they don't stay on the books as much. You know, there's little to lose, little to gain, little to lose, right? If I just drop this because it's a small amount of coverage. Uh, I don't think that way. Uh, I don't know. I, it's hard to say sometimes who's going to keep their policies and who's going to drop it. So, um, look, I just sell them something, hope it sticks. I do a good job trying to sell an affordable premium. And, uh, you know, the rest, we'll see what happens. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, who stays on the book longer? Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, it's hard, too hard to say. Um, just sell them all, man. That's all I can say. All right. Uh, yes, your kids. Yes. Michael, when you get kids one day, you'll see what I mean. All right. Vin says, seems like there's a lot of attrition after a few months. With AIG, you're in trouble if the insurance stops for any reason prior to 24 months. Um, not quite. Um, I'm like 95% sure of this. AIG will charge you back, um, of course, for, let's see how this works, 25% um, of the as earned within the first six months. You get a six-month advance with AIG. If it laps after the first six months, then I believe you're in the clear. You don't have to pay any of the advance back. Of course, if death occurs because of in the first two years with AIG, you have to pay the full commission back. That's true of any guaranteed issue for the most part. AIG used to be where if you had a lapse within the first 12 months, you'd have a full charge. And that's a lapse, guys. It would be a full charge back in the first 12 months. Then it would be 50% in year, uh, two, uh, year, uh, month 13 through 23, second year. But I think they've relaxed that. Um, I'm pretty sure they have because I do a little more AIG and I remember looking at some of the changes they made. I'm pretty sure the first six months there is that potential. But, um, you know, you're in a position where uh, once you get past that, it's not if it lapses. I've, I've, had, uh, I had, I've had circumstances where, um, you know, GI, that's a whole different segment. Uh, my take on guaranteed issue is there's no perfect guaranteed issue carrier for final expense. They all have a, a negative with them. Um, you just got to figure out which negative you can afford the best to deal with. Uh, I used to have a great, great price guaranteed issue carrier, paid well, advanced commission, but it would be a uh, full chargeback on laps. And uh, I took the risk there. I didn't have any problems with that product uh, because it was so well priced. Uh, but then you've got other ones like, like Great Western is very expensive, uh, but there's no chargeback after death if it occurs after the first nine months. But there is a full charge back if lapse occurs within the first 90 days. Uh, and then Gerber, it does an advanced commission. It pays really low. So, and then there's a two-year charge back on that. So it's like all guaranteed issues is inferior in some way, but you're dealing with people who are otherwise like not in good shape. If you can't get them with Transamerica on standard, there's probably something real bad with them. So, you know, you kind of kind of have to take, if you're going to go that route, that's kind of what you have to look towards too, unfortunately. Uh, Michael says, yes, money is money. Absolutely. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you're helping people. You can't be stated enough. And some people can't afford. And look, a lot of the times you'll come back and sell them another policy. Sometimes the way people are, if they've never bought insurance before, they're scared. They know it's important, but it's money that they normally would spend on booze and cigarettes. So what are they going to do if they don't have that money there? Um, so if we take 50 bucks and we push for 50, they may lapse. They may call up and have bad buyer's remorse. I'd rather start those people off with 20, get them used to it for six months, 12 months, go back and sell them another 30 that they need. Uh, something is better than nothing in this business, okay? So that's why I'm not a person to pressure. I know the final expense crowd quite well, at least the prospects are. And I want them to buy something that they'll forget about in the sense of it being affordable. And uh, I've been around long enough and you guys should trust me on this. Uh, you'll, you'll see your client's skin. You'll sell them more. I mean, think about it. About half the people you see that send cards in or reply to uh, re, you know, leads, they've already got insurance. Ironically, where's the agent that sold the first policy? I mean, uh, he should be there selling it, right? But the important point is, is 
hey, if this person bought once, half of these people bought once and they're going to buy again, that could be you in a year or two. Uh, you'll go sell more to these people, to some of these clients. And they're always nice, easy sales. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today on the uh, live stream here. I do hope that you enjoyed this particular training on pre-qualifying. Again, this is my favorite subject to teach. I think it's really good uh, for all agents uh, that sell insurance to learn to effectively pre-qualify. If you have any comments or questions, you're welcome to leave them below. I like to individually answer everybody that has any kind of uh, probing questions for me that you'd like me to follow up on. If you'd like more information about my mentorship program, you can go to feagentmentor.com, check me out, see what I have to offer. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe if you like the idea of getting daily insurance sales training videos. I do videos Monday through Friday on a variety of different subjects. Uh, Currently, I do interview videos with top producers. I also do live trainings like I do now. Uh, and then a product-specific training on like mortgage protection, final expense, met, eventually Medicare supplement here in a few months. Uh, so if this is that kind of thing is for you, subscribe and definitely like the video if you haven't already. And before I log off, I'll remind you my name is uh, Dave Duford at Final Expense Age Mentor. We'll see you later. Take care.